the topic of the conversation is uh, meant to be a bit punny, cover your assets, and we're gonna just basically talk about everything that has to do with um, copyrights and, and how these are basically assets. These are your assets that you own uh, in, 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 in their entirety or in part. And so uh, I wanted to bring in um, to this conversation uh, two of my really, really good friends. These are people that I've known for years. Uh, in fact, Mike McCarty, um, who was the former president of EMI Music Publishing in Canada, who's now the chief membership officer at SOCAN. I, I half-heartedly joke that 25 years ago, he refused to sign me to a publishing deal. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and yet here we are. And that then, never happened to you. <laughs> I, just, I, I, I made that mistake. I actually did sign him. <laughs> and Zach did sign me. Actually, in fact, I, I, I'm, I'm very proud to say that I recouped that deal six times uh, in a row um, uh, while Zach was the president at BMG well, Music Publishing. And he never asked for another advance, which shows he wasn't covering his assets very well. <laughs> Yeah, okay. uh, I know. Um, and uh, but so, so I really want to introduce these guys. These, 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 not only are they good friends, and these are people that are are incredibly well respected in the industry, but I mean, they are two of the most uh, forward thinking and progressive individuals that I know, and I'm pleased to call them friends. So, uh, without further ado, uh, I want to introduce both my friends, Mike McCarty and Zach Katz. Now. Uh, let's just jump right in. Mike, if you can give us a little sort of, you know, two or three minute brief history of time that leads us to today for you. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Uh, pretty exciting. Uh, excited to be here with Zach. Uh, I really admire Zach and I particularly admire the name of this company, which I, I, I think is amazing. Um, thanks, Mike. And um, I, I admire what uh, Justin and Curtis have done with Midio. Uh, so hopefully we'll get some plugs in for Midio a little bit later. Uh, because I think they're up some, to some great things. Uh, I was a failed drummer. I was a failed recording engineer, a failed record producer, and then I became sort of a successful music publisher. Uh, and throughout that journey, uh, when I started the journey, uh, it was a quest to find the secret of making a magic record. And I, because I was into electronics and music, I thought, you know, maybe it's got something to do with the electronic side of it. I was interested in recording engineering, uh, all the knobs on a board. This is the era of a lot of obvious technology creeping into music with uh, Sgt. Pepper, Dark Side of the Moon, that kind of thing. So I thought it was how you manipulated the technology that was the secret to making a magic record. And then as, um, a, as my career progressed, I went to Fanshawe College in London, Ontario, uh, Canada, which is a music industry arts program. It was the very first program in the world that was accredited to teach music in, uh, engineering and production. And I was in the inaugural class, so uh, it was quite a while ago now. Um, and I managed to get a job working for my heroes, Jack Richardson and Bob Ezrin. Bob uh, is a very well-known producer, of course, produced Alice Cooper, The Wall, uh, uh, Kiss. Jack was the guy who discovered and produced the Guess Who, which to me revolutionized Canadian music. And um, once I became an engineer, uh, I started to realize it wasn't what I was doing to the sound that was coming in the board that was the secret. It was something that was coming in the board. It's embedded in what's coming in the board. And so then I thought, well, maybe, maybe producing is the secret. So I, uh, I became a producer. And, I, and after I became a producer, I realized, no, it's not what, you, what you're doing to the sound electronically. It's not how you're guiding the performance, it's not how you're guiding the singer. That's not the secret to making a magic record. The secret is what the singer is singing, the song. And it all became clear to me that that's what I was all about and what I was interested in and what I was good at is, is identifying songs. And so I became a music publisher. And uh, then about six years ago, I came over to SoCan. I was on the board of SoCan for about 25 years uh, as a publisher and I'm the head of the membership. And uh, our job is to recruit and retain our members. And uh, it's a pretty exciting uh, job, and it's pretty challenging this month, of course, but um, uh, I enjoy it. And uh, I just just to add on to your resume for a moment, what Mike is very quickly grazing over is the fact that during his tenure at EMI, uh, he was, uh, I would actually really say, and I'm not just saying to you, I would say to anybody, he was quite visionary in the fact that he was identifying young, uh, undiscovered, really, talent and um, using you know, my music publishing as a support tool to help launch careers for Three Days Grace and Some 41 and a, a, a myriad of other ex incredibly successful Canadian uh, acts on a global level. 
So uh, coming out of Canada, and that was at a time when uh, I think that he would agree uh, Canada was not exporting talent in the way that it, it is now. So kudos to you, Mike. Um, I wanted to also now introduce Zach. So maybe Zach, a little brief history of time uh, that brings us to this sure. point. Sure. So I started my career uh, by following my parents' dreams for me, um, rather than my own. I started out as an attorney because uh, that was, you know, we we were uh, we came over from Russia many many years ago. Meaning, I was born there and when came here as a young kid, and my parents always wanted me to be a lawyer or a doctor. So. Being as squeamish as I am, I chose uh, the less scary one. I became an attorney and was a music attorney from day one. My wife had, and I had our own practice that we launched right out of law school. But I was I was a music attorney, meaning that I, I, I looked after people's copyrights. I got people record deals and publishing deals and management deals and came to this realization that as much as I love practicing law, I felt like I was on the wrong side of the equation people were going out there doing all the fun stuff creating opportunities creating deals creating collaborations and then it was kind of given over to me to uh, to paper it up and i wanted to be in the action so um i i was very fortunate I, I, one of my legal clients actually asked me to manage him and i um i started managing him he was a songwriter producer through that i met dr dre uh with who i i worked with for probably about five years managing most of his writers and producers and some of his artists learned how to make records from him and then with one of my producer clients, J.R. Rodham and his brother Tommy Rodham, we launched a record label, a music publishing company called Beluga Heights. Uh, got very lucky, found a young artist named Sean Kingston that we signed when we when we had a, a label deal over at Sony Epic. Uh, from there, we moved our label over to Warner Brothers where we signed Jason Derulo. Um, uh, we had a successful publishing company, signed Evan Bogart, who's still a dear friend to, to me and, a, and a, a collaborator to Justin and I in various projects and it was great had successes had failures had everything in between like everyone else does learned lots of lessons took lots of punches put up some points um and then you know figured after being in the industry on my own for about 17 years and staying out of the quote-unquote major system never having a job for anyone else i wanted to go and get into rooms with people who are smarter than me people who would who i who i can have different conversations and broader conversations with and uh, at that point, BMG was back in business for a couple of years. I was very intrigued by the comeback story. I'm always looking at the psychology of why people do what they do. And I was like, okay, these guys don't have to be in music. They're a $30 billion multimedia family and company, and they've decided to come back. Why? And I found out that they were well-intentioned and they wanted to build something that was modern. And for me, being an entrepreneur, it was a blank canvas with tons of paintbrushes and paints. And that was super attractive to me. So I joined there as head of A&R in publishing on the West Coast. Back then, BMG wasn't back in records at that point. A couple of years into that, I became uh, the chief creative officer for North America. A little bit after that, I became head of music publishing for North America. And then for the last three years uh, before leaving at the end of 2018, I was uh, the head of the US company for records publishing and everything else. And it was frankly, me getting my PhD in the music industry, just dealing with everything. I was obviously always very creatively and marketing focused, but this was, you know, running a big 400 person company, three offices in the US, LA, New York, and Nashville. And that's really where I got, where I got those PhD chops, so to speak. And then towards the end of that, you know, it was, you know, I always have these look in the mirror moments every five to seven years. I was like, okay, what am, what am I doing in my life? Do I like who I see in the mirror? Am I up to great things? Am I collaborating with people and having intelligent conversations? And that led me to really thinking about the future of the music industry, which which I wanted to stay in, but I really wanted to figure out where music was going in terms of innovation and just felt like we as an industry never proactively innovated. I mean, I think most industries are trying to hold on to the past. I think we're a prime example of that. Um, and uh and saw the music industry starting to wake up to that a little bit starting to see the industry say okay we need to figure out what's coming next uh otherwise we're gonna lose lose the vital every, everything that's vital to us starting with you know having real contact direct contact uh with our with our fans which we frankly in, in my view and we can talk about this later if you want uh we've really given that to uh to the tech companies um so you know saw the music industry waking up another side of the street were great tech founders who are creating you know, great solutions, but ultimately never really understood why the music industry was failing to innovate. Um, and I saw an opportunity uh, to take these two kids by the hands, the music companies and the tech companies, guide them into the sandbox, 
create a common language that they can both speak and foster proactive collaboration for the first time ever. So we launched Raisin Space to do just that um, at the top of 2019. I did that with uh, a few partners. One of them is Scooter Braun. One of them is an incredible uh, music tech film entrepreneur, Shara Senderoff. And we're backed by a company called Ripple, which is a blockchain company who's really reinvented the way people transfer money from country to country. So I'm sorry that I, I took so long to to uh, give the background, but that's a little bit about me. No, we appreciate it. And, and this is exactly why I wanted to have both of you gentlemen on the call with us today, because you guys have really seen the evolutionary arc of how how music is monetized. You know, in, you know, right now we're going through coronavirus, but in many ways the, the music business coronavirus was Napster. And um, we, we sort of have had to evolve. And I think actually in most cases become much stronger uh, in terms of how we monetize music and how we 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 can find multiple different revenue streams, and I wanted to talk about obviously the importance of copyright. You know the fact that basically we're all music publishers and we're both coming and, and we're all coming at it from a different perspective, right? Uh, even though Mike was a publisher, he's now been very fortunate to be the chief membership officer at SoCan, and maybe Mike, you could talk about some of the other. Uh, aspects of SoCan, like for example, I think that a common conversation that I have with a lot of songwriters and um, and even publishers in many cases, even people working within publishing companies is, oh well, my PRL, all they do is they they collect my royalties and they send me a check twice or four times a year or whatever. But you know, we've had relationships uh, on on the professional level with SoCan for years. Uh, MIDI, of course, is is partners with SoCan in terms of getting your uh, uh, songs registered at SoCan right through the website. But is isn't a PRO more than that? Isn't a performance rights organization just more than just collecting money and sending checks to people? That's a great question. I mean, uh, obviously, it depends on which PRO you're talking about. But don't forget, I mean, at its core, the, our number one job is to keep your money straight and. Uh, you know, I know you want to talk about what else we can do, but we can't gloss over the importance of that, uh, how difficult it is, and how, how uh, really it's a Herculean job these days. I mean, everybody's drowning in data. I mean, we're just tracking, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions, if not billions of performances a day uh, of your music uh, all over the world, uh, you know, through a network of PROs. So it's not a simple job. So Zach, when you were a publisher and you were watching the, music business evolved like you know it wasn't just well you sell records and you get music on the radio like what what are some revenue streams that you can look at in terms of uh of how you can monetize your assets well let me i mean look i i, I think that and i apologize i don't know my camera wasn't on not that not that i'm that much to look at but i, I yeah. wanted to be here in per, i wanted to be here in person so to speak um with you guys look i think that the pandemic is really exposing the music industry for for exactly what it is right and 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 frankly a lot of that is what our limitations are so in 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 my view the music industry has for the past 60 years has been a three lane highway right it's when it comes to what we can offer fans at least right it's buy my music buy a ticket to my show and watch me perform or buy my merch right and when you have three those three lanes and you're not innovating and you're not proactively figuring out what lane four five six seven and eight are going to be you're going to be in this position which is right now half of our three lane highway is shut down live is gone right um merch which is largely tied to live is gone and everybody's scratching their heads trying to figure out what to do. And frankly, I think that the music industry is being very, as it always is, reactionary. We're, what, well, what are we gonna do? We have artists sitting around at home. It's like, you know, these are things we should have been figuring out before a pandemic, because it's been that same three lane highway forever. We've just been now caught with our pants down, right? And everybody's solution right now is let's do live streaming. By the way, don't get me wrong, I love live streaming, right? I love the spirit behind giving our fans a, a, a gift of music at this extremely challenging times, but the music industry is 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 you know when we, it comes to live streaming, nobody's thinking about volume, nobody's thinking about cadence, nobody's thinking about business models, nobody's thinking about creative, and frankly, we're you know a bunch of bunch of uh, airplanes flying in the sky with no air traffic control. Everybody's canceling each other out. I think in a matter of a few weeks, people are going to be tired of 
live streaming, if we don't figure out to put a, to put a, an actionable, sustainable um, framework around it. So when we talk about new revenue streams, this could have been a new revenue stream, right? Post the pandemic, but we're very, very close to killing it, right? Because when I see my favorite artists 30 times over the next three months, am I gonna wanna pay 150 bucks to go see them thereafter to see, the, to see them do the exact same thing? I can't tell you yes or no, but I feel like we're not thinking about it or talking about it. So I think I think that the music industry needs a massive overhaul, and that includes everything from finally uh, looking at our industry with a real sense of ROI and precision. We spend billions of dollars every year signing talent, giving them mo the money to create music and create visuals. But when it comes to marketing, we're like, uh, I guess we'll try this and try this and try that. There's no ROI. And there's no ROI around marketing spend because first and foremost, we can't even reach our audiences. They're all behind a paywall called Google, Facebook, and Twitter. And we're just renting those over and over and over, right? Uh, the other way that we've been exposed for our limitations is, you know, it's that three, it's that three lane highway. Why have we not figured out how to, how to meet the demand of the thousands of companies being born, social companies, messaging services, uh, creation tools that all live online that wanna use our music but we have no way to be able to get the music in a in a in a fast and equ an equitable way. They have to wait in line for twenty more four months uh, to be able to get licenses from the majors just to even turn music on in their pipelines. And 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 all of the music companies, we know that those are customers. We know that that's a five billion plus dollar revenue line. But we haven't figured out a way to be able to to connect with those uh, to, with those new new uh, businesses and fulfill that demand. Why are we looking at the world? of video games with envious eyes, seeing that they're a $150 billion business, which frankly is three plus times more than we are. And we still haven't figured out a new approach to get music into video games in, in a much more actionable and unique ways. It's like, you know, you speak to somebody from EA and sorry, just one last thought, you speak to someone from EA, it's like, okay, I have Madden coming out. I need 30 songs. And every single publisher out there is trying to kill each other to try to get as many of their songs into that game for as high of a sync fee as possible, right? So. It's just, we're leaving money on the table. We're, we're doing business in the same way that we did uh, 60 years ago. We haven't learned all of that much from streaming because when that airplane was going like this before streaming came and saved us, the minute, the minute that it did save us, nobody stood up and said, well, what have we learned prior to, prior to streaming saving us that we can actually action going forward post streaming? So honestly, it's a lot of the same that we've seen for, um, forever and i think that most of that is is as much as we love technology and that's what i do spend my time investing into in hands-on guiding tech companies it's not technology that needs to save the music industry it's the music industry that needs to figure out a new framework for 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 uh for making money frankly right so um and and for having new incentives that incentivize everyone in the ecosystem to look at innovation not from a tomorrow point of view but from a today point of view even from a yesterday point of view, because it's really, it's really what we what, what we should have had. I mean, look, I I, I totally agree, and um, you know, a shameless plug for a moment here, and this is actually part of the reason why I, as a songwriter, kind of strategize video. Just just so that you guys know, like like total full disclosure, you know, I was showing video to Mike three years ago. I was showing video to Zach when he was still president uh, at BMG, and 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 they've been really instrumental in guiding uh you know being the wind in our sails so to speak um uh, in how we are constantly sort of also trying to evolve and how we give you guys a tool because i think what's interesting about what zach just said uh is you know you're talking a, a lot about it from sort of a label publisher perspective but it's also really about you know this these lanes are available to indie artists if you're going to put the effort in don't you think if you're going to do your own marketing and you're going to and you're going to be your own sales person, uh, you know th those those opportunities are there for you as well. Would, would you say? I think that I think that it, it's there's never been a better time to to steer your own ship and be independent. And there's absolutely tools and companies, including Medio, that allow you to become powerful. But I think that it's, it's also an extraordinarily challenging time, just because there's so much clutter to cut through. Right. And I think the reality is um, I'm scared shitless of New Music Friday. Right. Yeah. Because no, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. Because you have every Friday, 50 new songs come out that are supposed to be the best and brightest songs that we have. Right. 
and people spend tens of thousands of dollars in blood, sweat, and tears creating those songs. And guess what? They live for a week. And the next Friday, here comes 50 new ones. And everybody's forgotten about the 50 from the week before. And obviously, the ones from two weeks before are ancient. So it's like, it, it, it goes back to, it goes back to, yes, it's great to be independent. And there's all of these distribution channels, marketing channels, monetize, monetization channels that are in your fingertips, but it's also clutter. And I'm seeing a lot of artists, um, frankly, phone it in. I'm seeing a lot of people copy each other. I'm not seeing a ton of originality. So yeah, we can give artists a framework through which they can thrive. But still, I, I, at a time when our attention as consumers is, is stretched as much as it is, I think artists really need to step up creatively. And the other thing, guys, on that point, I think that artists have to become much, much more responsible for their own education. When you compare artists as citizens of this music industry to, to other people who live in, under, in other industries, I don't think artists are educated enough about their own businesses. And I think it's all of our responsibility, publishers, managers, lawyers, friends, to really create an environment where artists can know where their money comes from, which tools to use. But you can't, you can't force artists to do that. Artists have to step up for themselves as well. What is the importance of a publisher in today's day and age? Do, does somebody need a publisher? Um, at what point should you consider a publisher? Like, what are some of your thoughts on that? So I, I, I think that it's crucial to have the right people at your table as far as a team, right? I also think it starts with two things before you can even go to that, to that uh, line of thinking. Number one, what are my ambitions, right? Mm -hmm. um, and where am I in relation to those ambitions? Where am I in my career path, right? And everybody's completely different. You speak to certain artists or songwriters and producers, if they are not touring the world 100 times over and making $75 million a year as far as they're concerned and have hits on the radio every two seconds, they're a failure. Then you have certain people who are like, hey man, I'm cool having a nine to five as long as I get to come home and do what I love to do, which is, which is to sit in my home studio and create music and, and get it out, right? So I, I think first and foremost, it starts with your ambitions, number, number one. Number two, it all depends on where you are in your career. Let's talk about an ambitious songwriter, producer, artist who wants to ultimately, you know, be 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 a, a hit driven uh, creator. I mean, the reality is, when you're beginning, and 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 you have creativity and you have ambition, you need as many people in your circle that are going to be able to number one, beat up your songs and and know the difference between your A minuses and your A pluses and push you towards your A pluses. That's number. That's first and foremost, right? Uh, num number two, um, be until you get to a place where you, the phone is ringing every two seconds and Bruno Mars and Beyonce and Lady Gaga are calling you, you need somebody that's going to run around and actually uh, uh, knock on all of those doors and scream your name from rooftops, right? So when you start, if you're if you're ambitious and you and you need a full team around your ambition i think having a publisher is really really important to the extent that you can get people to be excited about you right in the same way that having the right manager the right attorney is really really important i think when you get to a place where where you you know have figured out what makes you brilliant and what makes you stand out what makes people want your records and you may may need a little bit less a and r help right and at that particular point people are calling you and your manager is just vetting phone calls and helping you strategize which ones to put your time and energy into, then it goes into, in my view, it goes into an admin situation, right? In terms of, in terms of the transition. So, so it's just a question of who am I? What do I want to do? Where am I in that cycle of building the, my vision for my career? And who, who, you know, who needs to be at the table and in, in, in what capacity? And what am I willing to give up, frankly, because it is an economic conversation at the end of the day to some extent, what am I willing to give up in order to have these people at the table? That's how I would frame the conversation. Right, but that doesn't, but, but that doesn't preclude you from doing a lot of that sort of lifting on your own. I mean, I remember for me, when I was starting and I was you know, a very ambitious young songwriter and I had my first sort of quote unquote hit in Canada, um, you know, I, I used that little tiny you know, I don't know what you'd want to call it, flash of light, uh, and and kind of leverage that into what it, what eventually became my first publishing deal, um, because I knew that that's where I wanted to go. And I think that too, some sometimes writers, uh, especially at a certain level, are are maybe intimidated by the idea, or, or even scared of the idea of a publishing deal. And I don't mean scared necessarily in the terms of frightened, but scared in like 
the idea of oh i'm giving up i'm giving up a piece of my ownership uh to somebody you know and, and not really understanding the the level of which now they can now rise to because of this newfound collaboration right so you can give and I know that plenty of people, and I think Midio actually has a really, really good feature that, that, it, that is built and offers in this. You can yeah. give writers the tools to be able to walk out of a session and get completely aligned with, their, with themselves, with their collaborators, and with their team on what was created, and with a touch of a button, uh, be able to get registration for it right that you know it's it's the challenge is not that there's plenty of companies that are doing that and are, and are creating those tools and again i'm not just plugging you i actually think medio has created something that's exceptional in that but guys let's be realistic it's not the, the limitation is not the technology it's the behavior most artists or songwriters or producers rarely after having a great session want to talk business right and 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 when they do if they do it's days later, not everybody remembers everything, and then you have your lawyers to get involved, which nothing is wrong with that either, but now the lawyers are fighting for to duke it out, um, to get their client the very best splits or whatever it is, and then all of a sudden, one of the writers sends the record over to a friend of theirs that, that changes a chord or adds a bridge, right? And now we have that level of complexity. I think until writers really start understanding what's at stake, and really understanding that that this is the revenue that we're talking about no technology in the world is going to be able to help us that's a great point I mean, that's that's exactly the point of what we're talking about here is making sure that that business the like writing it is fun but the business side has to be equally you have to pay equal attention if not more to the to the business side of it i think you make a great point yeah i Absolutely. think i think the answer is twofold the business side of the answer is you should register your songs as soon as you write them and as soon as you release them. Uh, because especially as soon as you release them or before you release them, because when you release them, you're probably going to be having some activity somewhere and, and, and you got to get the songs in the system in order to get paid. The creative side of that answer is don't release them until they're great. Um, uh, everybody probably knows that the great comedian Steve Martin universally considered to be one of the greatest comedians of all time. Well, he actually gives master classes on that website masterclass. And if you, if you Google his YouTube trailer for that, it's really interesting. And after about 10 seconds of funny stuff, he gets looks at the camera, he gets really serious and he says, you know, when I work with my with, with my comedy students, um, the first questions out of their mouth is, how do I get a headshot? Where do I get an agent? And I say to them, shouldn't your first question be, how do you be great? Mm -hmm. So, you know, so I, I think, <laughs> you know, uh, to you know, to um, to Zach's point earlier that there's incredible amount of noise out there. Um, there is an incredible amount of noise out there, and I think the way you rise above it is by being great and being unique and being a great artist and making great music. And whether you do that yourself or you do it collaboratively, uh, whatever you have to do to, to to be great, and then you know the business side, if, if properly laid out, will fall into place. I don't know if that's the answer you wanted. Well, no, I mean, no. That, that that's a good question. That's a good that's a good answer. But it's funny, you know. We all have, we all have relatives and spouses and partners that think that everything we do is great. How do you how do you how do you even where where do you even start to self critique? I guess that's a question for both of you guys. You don't self critique. Okay. And you don't yes. ask your and you and you don't ask people who who think that your shit doesn't stink. Right. That's the reality. That's part of that's part of creating a circle around you. It's like when your haters like your music, that's when you should be putting it out. When that friend or that person or that person on your management team or your publishing team who doesn't like anything that Justin Gray does is like, wow, I hate what you do, but that's fucking good. Then that's when you put it out. You know what? It's yeah. fun, it's funny. Um, Rick Rubin was interviewed and in, uh, by Tim Ferriss, and he he Tim Ferriss said, "How do you you know how do you know when you've done something good?" And he said, "Well." Because if you do something that everybody like is universally like, yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, he goes, you've totally failed. If you do something that's divisive, where half the people think this is absolutely amazing, the other half think it's total garbage. He goes, that's when you know you've really done something well. There's so, never been. There's just to jump in for one more thing, and I want I want Mike to take over because I've been doing all the talking. Um, there's uh, there's there's one thing that I will tell every single creative person that comes into my office. There's never ever ever in the history of the music industry been a worse time to be pretty good or just good. Just huh. you're, it's worth. It's literally, it's literally worthless. And if and if your response to me was like, "What are you talking about? Turn on the radio." 
it's mine is just as good as everyone else's. It's all just garbage. And they're all saying and doing the same thing. Well, guess what? You don't have the luxury of being one of those people that cut through with garbage. Now, what are you going to do about it? Right. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's an excellent, excellent point. I, I feel like, it, I feel like I can lift up a house now because of that. That's amazing. Thank you for that. On the other hand, on the other hand, I think that it's the greatest time ever to be getting in the music business. If you are great or intend to be great and will and we'll do whatever it takes to become great because nobody tells you, you can't make music and get into the world and the world can vote. I mean, the two, you know, the two, some of the, some of the best stories about the world voting on, uh, you know, uh, through the internet or through technology about, uh, and creating artist careers are Canadian, uh, Sean Mendez and Ruth B were the two biggest music stories on Vine. Um, you know, I mean, I, I remember talking to Ruth B, uh, shortly after she got her record deal, uh, you know, she was about a year and a half, two years ago, she had a song called Lost Boy. And I said, how did it happen? Ruth? She said, well, I was on Vine, I was posting covers on Vine. And of course, if you remember Vine it was uh, Twitter's version of YouTube, by definition, there were seven second clips of covers. And she had about 50 followers, friends and family. And then one day she covered a Drake song. I can't remember which one, but when you hear the, the, her doing, the, the idea of her doing it, it makes sense. And she said she closed her laptop, woke up the next day, she had a thousand followers. And this gave her such a burst of confidence that she wrote Lost Boy and did the same thing, played the piano, sang it into her webcam, posted it. And then at the time I was tell she was telling me this, she said, that was about six months ago. She said, now I have a record deal with Island Def Jam. Um, the song's rocketing up the charts and I just played my very first live gig ever in front of 10,000 people at iHeart Music in LA. Uh, you know, uh, that's the kind of stuff that can happen now, right? And look at Shawn Mendes, same thing. And, uh, but to, to Zach's point earlier, once you get to that attention, you still need to continue on the trajectory of being great and being having great marketing. And that's when you need team members. You need, I mean, it's not a coincidence that, that, that Sean has a record label and a manager and a lawyer and a publisher. Uh, there's still roles for them. Uh, and that's what helps put, propel him into the stratosphere and keeps him there. Yeah. And then the DRO. So can. Yeah. Well, <laughs> You know, again, this is, this is, you know, this is a, uh, you know, obviously, obviously, and this was a question I asked earlier when we lost you, which is, you know, typically we look at performance generating, royalties generated through performance, and, you know, we think it's radio and in TV, but it's, it's, it's really much more complex than that, isn't it? Yeah, well, it, it's, uh, it's everything now. I mean, and, and, you know, I mean, internet obviously is a huge revenue stream. Uh, in aggregate, not necessarily for every every person who's creating music. Uh, you got some performance roles. You've got radio, television, streaming. Uh, you've got live concerts. You've got what we call general licensing, which is you know the the retail stores, dentist office, restaurants, that kind of thing. Uh, and um, it all adds up, you know. And and and, um, uh, and it's interesting because uh, you talk about transitions, and we have a we're always looking at trying to understand what people euphemistically call it euphemistically call the middle class of music creators but if there ever was one uh but the people uh, the tier the tier under the stars under the people making a shitload of money the next tier down and um a lot of those people are faced now with the problem where they used to survive about a third of their revenue was live playing live about a third of their revenue was selling cds and about a third of their revenue was performance royalties and of course cds went away then downloads mostly made up for that and, you know, roughly made the same amount off of downloading an album, uh, having an album downloaded and, and sold that way. And now that's gone. And so streaming is not making up for it because it's a completely reverse business model. Buying an album is what I call the upfront payment. Uh, the, the customer, the, the, your fan, is crystal, you're crystallizing the lifetime value of that music to that person with an upfront payment. Uh, regardless of how often they listen to it or use it or whatever. Um, and that's gone now, right? So those people uh, are the ones that are in, 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 in under, you know, this tectonic sh plate shifting under them. If you're making um, hits, you're making more money than you ever made before. Right, that's true. That is true. I, I, I want to, if you can kind of talk to this, I don't think you have to go super deep into this, but if you were to say, what are, th what are three common mistakes that people are making with respect to um, with respect to their copyrights and their assets, especially from a PRO perspective, like what are, what are three mistakes you see every day? 
Well, first of all, the biggest challenge that the world, royalty world has would be at PROs, be at record label royalties, et cetera, and, uh, is we're all drinking from a polluted data lake. Um, the, the amount of crappy data, inconsistent data, conflicting data, and wrong data floating around the world and associated with your songs and your recordings is unbelievable. And, um, and that is the biggest challenge we all have. And, the, and that lake is polluted because the incoming streams are polluted. And the number one source of incoming stream pollution is, Justin, you and I write a song, and I think it's called I Love You. You think it's called Love Ya. Uh, we both register it, and maybe with two of our publishers, deliver it to a publisher. One guy's published, the other one's not. So you deliver it to your publisher, and you, and you, and you say it's called Love Ya. It's uh, 6040 Justin Gray and Mike McCarthy. And um, I deliver it to uh, SoCan, and I say it's 50-50. Uh, it's called I Love You, and it's written with me and Justin Gray, G-R-E-Y. And right there, it, 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 it is um, show-stopping pollution. And it just goes on and on from, from there. Well, you've walked into my trap because, <laughs> not intentionally, but that's actually, this is actually, you know, again, uh, you know, I, I, as you guys know, this, this is really not about selling MIDI as a platform. It's free to use if you want to use it. You just literally go and sign up at Midio.com, M-D-I-I-O.com. Um, and I really don't want to touch too much about it, but that was actually one of our big intentions was how do we create a single point of truth for these copyrights that, for example, I open up, uh, you know, um, this song here and I automatically know that, you know, this, this is the split between me and Marty. And if I want to, I can register this at our PRO and everybody understands that we're, we're trying to clean that data, that, that, that polluted data lake, as you kind of call it. I mean, you know, and it needs to start somewhere. I agree. And, the, and the, really the challenge is, I think, is that the more songs get, that get written on an exponential growth rate, literally every day there's a million new songs written worldwide, that data, that lake just gets dirtier and deeper, doesn't it? And so- yeah, And the, what has to happen is like, I, one of you said earlier, uh, you have to get the business out of the way, right? So before you inject the, the, the songs, into the worldwide ecosystem, be it the metadata system, you know, the, just with registering at a PRO or putting it up in TuneCore or whatever, uh, you've got to figure out the splits. And that's one of the good things about Midio is that you have a platform and, a, and, a, and, a, and an ability for the, all the participants to figure out the splits and the spellings and all right. the ITI numbers and every piece of metadata associated with that song before it gets injected into the system. And that's the key. I want to say something that I also like about Midio that 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 that's this feature that you shared with me because to me I'm coming at the entire thing not from tech which obviously I am but before tech I'm coming at it from behavior and incentives right so to me what I like about Midio is the fact that if you and I write a song together and and this is what Midio does it shows me the activity that's going on with that song correct like I see who's being pitched and all of these things right if look we writers write millions of songs every day. They're like, fuck it, it's just another song. Pardon me for, for cursing. Can I curse here? Yeah, man, you can. Fuck it, it's just another song. So <laughs> so, so if it's just another song, why am I going to pay attention to it? Uh, frankly, I wasn't even sure if I loved it when we left the studio. I'm, I'm already on to the next one. You know, why am I going to go spend time like trying to register an A, B, C, D, and E? But if, but if there was enough of an alignment and the song goes into video, and all of a sudden I'm like, I may not love the song, but my co-writer Justin, through him, it's been pitched here, here, there, here, and there. Shit, maybe, maybe I actually need to start paying attention to the song. Starting with, are we aligned on what Mike just talked about? The basics, the name of the song, the splits, A, B, C, D, and E. So, to me, the more we can create technology that 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 prompts a behavior of of paying attention, right? Where people have an interest and a real and know what's at stake. Because that's what we don't have enough of. Writers don't really understand what's at stake. And if they really understood exactly what's at stake, they would treat it differently. In the same way that if somebody has a disease, God forbid, they need to take a pill every day. And they know that if they don't, the, those, those are gonna, there's going to be certain consequences. It's got to be the exact same thing. So that's what I like about Midio is the fact that, okay, I wrote it. I may not be sure about it, but this, this thing has legs. There's something at stake here. Now let me lean in and make sure that everything is registered. And I just want to jump off that point for a second. The whole the whole idea too is that because we're aggregating a single point of truth for the copyright, if I write a song with Mike and with Zach and I tag them as collaborators, those songs automatically show up in their database. So we're again coming back to we're co-sharing that single point of truth on that song. What does that mean? It means 
that now taking Mike out of the songwriting, taking his songwriting hat off and putting his, his PRO hat on, right? Now all of a sudden that means that this song, when it gets registered at the, P, at, at the PRO level, is going to be accurate. The splits are going to be accurate. The songwriter is going to be accurate. The name of the song is going to be accurate. The IPI numbers are going to be accurate. All of these things. So that's that's a huge part of streamlining the process, which allows you, ironically, even though it's administrative, allows you to kind of continue to be more um, creative. I, I wanted to, Mike. I wanted to jump into one more sort of kind of um, overarching question about PROs in general, and then I want to open the floor up to some questions from uh, from from our group of people. The, the main question is, if you can find a way to, to uncomplicate this as much as possible, this is going to be a tough one. Um, how does the Music Modernization Act affect uh, the song the people on the songwriting level? Uh, great question, and it is hard to simplify it, but basically the Mo Music Modernization Act, um, I think, if I recall correctly, had three major components to it. Uh, and it was it was because it was bringing together three separate lobbying actions from three different you know parts of the industry and and one of them was believe it or not in America by the way um, I think America is a fantastic country American copyright environment is one of the worst in the world and the only reason why it doesn't get talked about a lot is because it's such a big country and market and rich market that if you have success you make a lot of money and everybody forgets how how bad some of the elements of it are. And, uh, and one of the bad elements was that was that um, uh, records made before 1972, uh, the streaming services didn't, or they claimed anyway, they didn't have to acknowledge that they're still in copyright. And um, so it, it corrected that problem so that uh, the, the streaming services had a, 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 a copyright of the older recording. Um, and uh, it also brought into, uh, more of a legal standing of, uh, and Zach being a lawyer, an ex-lawyer would be able to describe it better, but bringing into more of a legal standing, other participants in a recording like the producers, who, who historically have often had to rely on the artist paying them at the end of the value chain, rather than getting paid directly from the, the source of exploiting the music. And most importantly for the songwriters, thirdly, um, it created a, it simplified the mechanical licensing or the, the reproduction rights licensing for the digital services. Uh, so that it created a sort of a blanket license, more like a performing right license uh, to simplify it because it would turn, it was a mess. Uh, everybody admitted it was a mess. And hopefully out of that comes easier licensing, simpler licensing process, uh, fewer songs not, uh, not being licensed when they're up in the services. And it, uh, what it did though is let the services off the hook for um, uh, statutory damages. Uh, going forward, um, uh, when they do commit copyright infringement, which is, I'm sure, generally by accident. I don't know. Does that answer the question? Well, yeah. And I was going to actually sort of jump off that question for one one more quick question. Now, anybody could put their music up on a DSP on on Spotify or YouTube or whatever, and they'll happily stream it. But they won't pay that money to you if that if if they can't um, if, if they can't uh, uh, cross it against your, your PRO registration, they'll basically hold on to that money, and you're not you're not going to see it, right? Right. So, so especially for smaller independent artists, smaller uh, smaller publishing companies and labels, etc., uh, it's really uh, it's supposed to help uh, them because there's a central place where you can uh, register your songs and uh, and it becomes part of the blanket license system. So, so that that is supposed to be one of the advantages. Right. So again, of course, it's about metadata and good good information, and, uh, you, and then you can get paid. Um, so the MLC, the mechanical licensing co cooperative, I think. Right. You should you should you should be you should be like a big shot at a PRO, Mike. You know what you're talking about. Um, can we? Uh, we're gonna we're gonna open the floor up to Zan. I know Zan has been collecting some questions. Zan, you still there? All right. Um, this one's from Devin. Um, sorry. Hold on. How will PRO revenue, specifically ASCAP, be affected by COVID in the short term, long term? Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. I, I know Mike, you probably anticipated that question. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think Mike can't really answer for ASCAP, but maybe you can give Sokan's perspective on it. Yeah, uh, that's right. Exactly right. I can't answer for ASCAP, but I think the way Sokan works, and I and I thought this was the way most of the PROs work, and ASCAP's recent announcement was a bit puzzling because it seemed to counter contradict what I'm saying. But anyway, so very simplistically how we, and I believe most of us work is, imagine the incoming license fees from the licensees being radio, television, uh, 
uh, live uh, uh, and, and streaming services. Imagine they're coming into a giant bucket um, and, and of money. And at the bottom of that bucket is a tap. And every quarter, the tap opens. And one quarter's worth of the money flows out of the tap, gets matched to all the usage of the songs and paid to the people who wrote and own, own those songs. So the, the bottom layer of money, especially at SOCAN, for instance, is nine months old. And uh, so uh, after that layer comes out, the next quarter, the layer above that is, is ready to be paid out. And that layer, uh, you know, is now nine months old. So simplistically, um, you know, uh, the, in, in our May distribution that's coming up, that distribution was paid for back in September, let's say. Uh, so there's about a nine month delay from when the money comes in to when it goes out. So, we are, of course, every PRO in the world, ASCAP, BMI, us, CSAC, uh, GMR, et cetera, are absolutely anticipating, and you'd be an idiot not to, that our revenue is going to go down. Uh, live has gone to zero. How much does live mean at a, at a overall at PRO? It's somewhere between 10 and 15%, depending on the country. Um, uh, so for the year, that might be down half or three quarters. Um, streaming seems to be holding its own. Radio and television, um, historically, whenever there's an economic downturn, uh, there's less advertising. So we all expect that's going to go down, whether it's, whether it's 5, 10, 15 percent, 20 percent, 25. Nobody knows at this point. But, then, but, that, but that's just going to get reflected on your payment effectively in, in two, well, in, the, in, in SoCan's case, in basically uh, three, three, three payments from now. Yeah, three quarters. Uh, and, I, and, and as I say, I thought that they all worked that way. So I was surprised by, by ASCAP's announcement. I don't know if there's other underlying issues that are mixing in there that, that have caused that announcement. I'm not sure. Appreciate that. N nice so to it's Actually, it's a beautiful thing because we're going to feel, you know, writers are generally and publishers are generally going to feel the pain later. Yeah, right. Of course. And of course, uh, you're open for, for, for bringing... So, you know, for, for signing up people to soak in uh, as well, um, new members. Um, is there another question? What's the next question, Dan? Uh, and this one's from Allison. I'd like to hear everyone's uh, ideas slash advocacy around sync licensing for live streams. You know, I'm going to hand this one over to Zach because uh, they're very involved in a company called Veeps, and I think that this is right in your wheelhouse. I mean, I, th I think that we absolutely need to have some form of compensation around songs being performed in live streams i mean it's it's if you know it's and, and right now there's two views on it there's obviously today's view when the industry is is in trouble frankly and we we have artists live streaming frankly not, not who aren't who aren't monetizing it who um who shouldn't be who shouldn't be tax so to speak for um for doing so just because they're giving back and everybody's giving back but at a particular point when live streaming and if live streaming continues to become a revenue stream or grows into a revenue stream there's no question that there needs needs to be licenses around that i i can't speak to the parameters of those licenses i can make some guesses but i think those would be uneducated guesses we you know people would need to get into a room and and stakeholders would need to have a conversation around it i think that it's it's two views it's the immediate which i think a lot of people are kind of letting it slide right especially for more independent and diy artists um and i think it's going to become a real conversation to be had as we look at live streaming as a potential revenue stream going forward i mean i think too if, if you're monetizing that live stream there probably needs to be a license yeah. but if you're just going live on on instagram i i think that's going to be really hard to track uh, i mean i don't know mike mike maybe would have an answer to that but i think that with, uh, it's uncertain well, you know, I, first of all, you know, most of these platforms have performing rights licenses. So in theory, there's performing right license in there, but getting the data, I mean, you got the money, you have to, you have to know what was performed and when it was performed, et cetera, right? Getting the data has always been a problem from uh, the digital platforms, which is ironic since they're the most advanced database companies in the world. You think that they would be able to provide usage data. And I think it's a, a combination of, uh, of uh, foot dragging and, slow realization that what they think them being tech companies that most of them never really understand our business they don't understand what we need to to, to conduct their business and they were years behind in developing the ability to spit out usage data so they're all scrambling to try and uh, come up with those the, those uh, capabilities now 
Um, and it's not fair, but it's the way it is. Perhaps by design a bit. Uh, Zan, what's the next question? This one's from Kiki. I'd like to know what you think about selling publishing of songs to a boutique, boutique sync company. Worth it to have those people rapping your songs? You know what, I'm gonna jump in on this one, you guys, even though uh, I respect both of your opinions, uh, because I'm a creative and a songwriter, and uh, I know it's not really about me, it's about these guys, but I think that you have to really be aware of when you use the word selling, and I don't mean that in a negative way, I mean, what does it look like? Because there's kind of three different ways that you can approach uh, how you bring in a partner. One is you can do a co-publishing agreement, which says, hey, you know, we're gonna, I'm gonna take a amount of money, whatever, one dollar, I'm going to get paid a one dollar advance against my future earnings and for that i'm willing to share a percentage of my copyright that i own and that percentage can range between for two years or it could be in perpetuity or it could be there's any any date range of how long that they would control the revenue stream um of course there's also what's called an admin deal which says you know basically i'm leasing you or i'm renting you the rights to collect on my revenue, usually the advances are lower and the percentage that you share is lower. And then finally, if literally somebody's coming in and saying, well, I'm gonna do a work for hire and buy that from you, um, you, know, you have to sort of look at it on a case by case basis because you're still gonna be earning your writer's share, although you're gonna be effectively selling your publisher share. And just so that everybody understands, even if you don't have a quote unquote publisher, you are in fact your own publisher. And so I urge you to register a publishing company with your PRO so that when that er those earnings come through, and God willing, you become a super duper successful writer and you start bringing in other partners uh, on your copyrights, you can assign them a share of your publisher share, but yet retaining your writing share. In other words, that's the money that, uh, that SOCAN or any PRO would send to you. Um, so uh, just, to, just to really do a super quick answer to that, um, it really depends on your partner. If they have a long history of being extremely good at at licensing your music, uh, then, um, then then I think it's it's worth doing. And also, you have to think: Is this the best song or best batch of songs I've ever written in my life? And is this the best that I will ever write? And probably the answer is going to be no. So for me, any way that you could take advantage of a of a strategic partnership and a relationship, uh, and that pushes ultimately pushes your career forward, uh, I think is a positive thing. Uh, but unless, of course, you want to do it on your own, and, and uh, you know, it's a little bit harder work. Uh, but just to go back to what Zach had said earlier, if you find the right partners, um, you know they can triple, quadruple, 10x your revenue just based on the deal that you've done, even though you're giving up a piece of it. Um, I don't know if you guys want to jump in on that uh, at all, but uh, I think I think it's all about having, as we talked about earlier, a real sober self-awareness around where you are and what your needs are, what your options are. You have there's there's so many different levers to pull and weigh in this conversation, right? That that just to give a yes or no, I think wouldn't be doing justice to your question, especially if that question is for you specifically. Um, I think you just have to know who you are. And 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 if every single move aligns with what you are trying to build for your career, right? And and my and if I was to give you any kind of categoric advice, would be apply a long term thinking to your career rather than a short term thinking. And if any and if you're making short term moves, those short term moves have to also align with a long term thinking. So if you need to sell something now. Because you know that's going to buy you, you know, twelve months of rent, so you can actually go and write the next ninety-nine songs. Then that may be that may be the move, right? But everything has to go towards and measured against a long-term thinking approach, in my opinion. Great answer. Uh, let's take a few more questions, Zan. Um, cool. I'm gonna actually put these together because they're similar. Um, this is from Felicia and then Richie as well. Um, Felicia says, hello, I'm a songwriter producer and have a catalog of music that I've created over the years. I think I have some gems and want to play songs in film, TV, and commercials. Not trying to make millions, but want to make a living doing what I love. How do I connect with a publisher that can place my songs? And then from Richie, uh, he asks, All the, also, are there red flags to look for that artists usually miss? That's that's an entire podcast. Or I'm sorry, an entire, an entire live stream. <laughs> uh well, I'll, I'll start. I'll start with the first one. You know what? Uh, when I look back on the evolution of my career and things that I still continue to do to this day, uh, I think networking is a huge is a huge aspect, and I think that sometimes it's overlooked. And, and again, I, you know, I know that it's about writing amazing songs. I get it. We we love that, but also it's a really about 
creating relationships and then being able to turn around and leverage those relationships if and when the time uh, you know sort of presents itself and so that's a big part of it and like if you really wanted to get into film and tv uh, there's a few ways we actually cover this on our on our how to write songs for film and tv um, uh, live stream that we did a couple weeks ago but really simple it's you know it's, here's an easy way log into imdb pro look at who the music supervisors are go and find them and 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 just connect with them don't be obnoxious about it uh but if you really feel like you have something that's amazing uh that you feel like you want to hear like if you think that you've written absolutely the perfect song for Grey's anatomy and you wanted to uh, try and submit that song and, and 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 again be brutally honest with yourself um you know go reach out and i'll tell you go reach out to chop shop they do all the music for it you know find somebody there build that relationship and uh, and i'll tell you what's interesting about music supervisors a lot of you might think oh you know well they only want to use whatever you know insert whatever biggest star that you know that's actually not true um, oftentimes music supervisors are looking to replace certain here's a perfect example right here here's a project that we had on online looking for replacement for fits in the tantrums hand clap what's interesting about this is by the way this is stuff that we actually have on video but i'm using it actually to support your question which is here they're looking these are the tags that they have and then they're looking to replace hand clap by fits in the tantrums and by the way they have a budget of 50 of 25 to fifty thousand dollars for it so like there you know there's an opportunity here's a, a live opportunity unfortunately it's 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 expired on on the platform but you know keep, keep your eyes open for those sorts of things and and as i said reach out to music supervisors they're very eager to find uh, artists that have uh, what's called 100 percent control over both their master ownership and their publishing ownership in other words if you're an artist and you've recorded your record and you own your publishing 100 percent that's you can get paid on both sides of that transaction meaning they have to pay for the publishing and they have to pay for the right to use the actual recording of the song so uh, to me, it's it's digging down and finding those relationships. You can reach out to music supervisors directly. They're not three-headed monsters. They're very eager to find. And in fact, you could talk to almost any music supervisor that you meet. They will acknowledge they love finding, you know, a, uh, a obscure band from Czechoslovakia that they just gave a check for a hundred thousand dollars to for a Ford ad. Like they love that sort of thing. So this is this is part of their. Um, they're, they're, you know, this is part of their lifeblood and, and music supervisors to film and TV function exactly the same way as A&R people to record labels, build those relationships, create those networks for yourself. And, um, you know, you might only need two or three music supervisors that believe in you and love you, uh, to, to make you a significant amount of money every year. Um, I hope that answers your question. And the next question was red flags. I mean, you guys want to jump on the red flags question? It's like anything in your in your in your life. Um, use your use your in, in, intuition. If somebody's giving you the creeps, then they're probably a creep. Yeah, and I would say I would say competitively speaking, this might be a bit of a shock for you guys, but um, you know, a management commission typically ranges from between fifteen and twenty percent of your revenue of your gross revenue and earnings. So if you're about to get into a publishing, uh, in, excuse me, into a management agreement, just sort of like. Keep your eyes open and keep in and, and and you know and oftentimes like my personal manager Brad Aaron's we don't even have an agreement we have a handshake we trust each other in that way so you know it it's you know if if you reading that document that you're getting put in front of you and it looks better for them than it does for you that's I'd say probably a, a pretty big red flag. I uh, think I think there's also lots of frankly lots of books that you can use to educate yourself today as well right like. Yeah. Of course, you know, education will come from having a team, people who know things, you know, uh, much more extensively than you do. But there is a certain level of self-education that falls, in my view, into the bucket of responsibility that every single creator should have read and 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 uh, studied and understood. So educate yourself. Great, great point. Great point. I think there's certainly uh, things like these webinars and other ways that you can sort of learn. I think it's huge. Totally, totally right. Let's take a couple more questions, Anne. All right. Uh, this is from Jordy. Uh, do I really need to file copyrights or register with PROs before uploading files with media or otherwise sharing songs? Can I just worry about that stuff later if revenue opportunities come into focus? You can. Um, I think that uh, video is uh, uh, or platforms like it are ways to manage your, your audio and your copyrights. And not every one of them necessarily wants to be in, in, in the wild. So uh, as I said earlier, um, if, if it's getting released, going to be released, you've got to get it into the system. And by the way, 
registering a song with the PRO does not register the copyright. All you're doing is setting up for monetization when when, you, when it gets performed. Um, and uh, you know, in the U.S., you if you register with the Library of Congress, uh, there's an awful lot of advantages to that. To uh, and, and if you you should probably do that with um, everything that you release as well. And also, we we digitally watermark every song that gets uploaded to Midio, so um, there's a date of creation. Uh, guys, Zach unfortunately has to jump off. Uh, we can continue taking a couple more questions as we're going here. Uh, Zach, thank you for your time today. I really, really appreciate your insight and expertise. Justin, thank you so much. Mike, thank you so much, everyone who joined. Guys, there's, you know, it's it's definitely a a time of learning, growth, reflection, and um, anyone who really wants to be in music, as I think Mike said earlier, this is a really, really good time, but just do it with a sense of responsibility, education, um, and uh, self-awareness. Have a, have a great rest of your week and weekend, and um, thank you again. Thanks to Midio as well, Justin. Really, really incredible progress. Speak soon. Thanks, guys. Exactly. Thank Mike, you, guys. Mike, we'll take a couple more questions here. Um, sure. uh, I'll try and field anything that would have been sort of geared towards Zach. Uh, so let's take a couple more questions, Zan. All right, this one's from Sheldon. What about as a producer, songwriter, making songs literally every day? Do you suggest that I immediately register to SoCan or PRO after I make each instrumental and song, even if I haven't released anything? Um, all my productions are named one thing as instrumentals after creating them. And then if I add vocals or work with a top liner, then it may be registered, or then it may be named something else later. And will I have to have that re-registered? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this for a bit and then maybe Mike can jump on. Uh, I, I don't think that you need to register your songs instantly and immediately. I think that as you, especially if you're just kind of building beats and, and, and kind of stockpiling some, some assets like that, I, I'm not, you know, I mean, something like putting it on, you know, literally just adding it to MIDI and tracking it there. And then of course, as you're adding versions and iterations to the song, you can keep it on the same, the same track page. That's obviously very, very important. Um, in fact, I'll show you how we've done it here. Take the song, for example. Uh, so let's say you have written a song, you can actually have uh, the, the beat, then what the song has become, and then eventually other different iterations. It's really simple. You just literally click this button and you can add whatever song you want, uh, whatever song iteration you want um, accordingly. Um, but, you know, but I think once it sort of like really gels and becomes formalized as a song, then I would say probably it makes sense. But no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't register like multiple iterations um, to SoCan. Again, I just think that opens up potential for creating more dirty data. Yeah, exactly. And and once again, it, 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 it's, I think the question might come from the perspective of feeling like it's protecting your copyright by doing that. And it, it, it registering with a PRO or uh, is not really protecting your copyright. It's enabling the monetization. So if there's nothing going on that, that, that is going to lead to monetization, then you don't need to. Right. And, and, and every time a song is uploaded to Midio, it's digitally watermarked. So you know, if for some reason, you know, there is a certain amount of, again, it, it's not, it's not Library of Congress, but there's a certain amount of, um, of, of historical uh, proof that we can give you to when the song was created. Um, and, and that can hopefully help. Um, anything else, Dan? Yeah, um, this one's from Corinne. Uh, I'm a songwriter, a new music publisher. If I pitch a song to a label that does their own publishing, will they try to force me to give them the publishing copyright of my song, or is it standard that they let me keep the publishing rights of my song? Not sure what the norm is. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I, I, I will tell you this. So I've had experiences. Typically, a lot of times, labels might, um, and maybe if, if, if actually, if Mike wants to put his publisher hat back on for a moment here, uh, typically, labels sometimes will ask for uh, for re for reduced rates on on paying out publishing so that they can um, use it to offset some of their costs for those artists. Uh, everything is totally and completely negotiable. So um, I wish that there was a more standard pat answer, but there kind of isn't. Like for example, um, originally when I wrote uh, a song that ended up being recorded by Mariah Carey, uh, you know, we wrote the song three ways, and then Mariah came in and she took a piece, and then. The people that actually co-produced the song with me, Stargate, then they took a piece, and so it, the, the 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 ownership of that copyright can shift uh, all the time. It can it can ebb and flow and change. And oftentimes, record labels will want to maybe not own the copyright, but they'll maybe want to retain a certain amount of that revenue uh, to go against their costs. Uh, it's called control copyright, and so um, so that that can happen. But again, just to go back to what Zach said. You know, you just have to sort of use your best 
uh, your, your best instinct, you know, reach into your instincts the best way that you can, because sometimes you don't want to kill an opportunity for a song because, uh, because the deal maybe looks bad, but when you look three steps down the line, you know, this cut can be amazing for you. Um, I don't know, is that, Mike, do you have an opinion on this? I mean, I think that obviously it depends on, 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 on the business model of the organization that you're thinking of signing to. And um, uh, you should ever feel that somebody's forcing you to do anything. Um, it should be a sober, uh, educated business decision. But on the other hand, you know, I always say that um, your rights are your currency that you're sort of given. It's, you, imagine if you're, you, know, you inherit the family farm, let's say. That's the, you now have an opportunity and a responsibility to handle that asset the best, most responsible way possible. Maybe that's to keep it in the family for the next few generations. Maybe it's to you know, sell it to a developer. Maybe it's to build houses on it yourself. Your rights are this, are similar type of asset and currency, and it's up to you to to do the smartest thing possible with them. And just and doing a deal in itself is not a dumb thing necessarily. The deal has to be right for you, though. Good question, Zan. Any more questions? Yes. Um, this one's from Craig. I write my own music, but sometimes pay a small fee to download a bunch of random tracks. Do I own those, or do those beat makers deserve a split? Also, when I bring my records to artists, they usually want to make some changes to the music or a whole new track. So, um, so uh, I'll jump into that. Um, famously, "Old Town Road" was an internet track, and so was um, and so was a d Panda Designer. And those people got paid, I think, two hundred and fifty bucks or something. And uh, they they relinquished their copyrights, their ownership of that copyright. So, uh, you know, I don't do a lot of that stuff, like Beatport or whatever, but I do know that the deals are different, like you can actually buy exclusives, but then again, you also have to be prepared to understand that, you know, you might buy an exclusive, but then someone changes a hi-hat pattern on that, and then suddenly it becomes a new exclusive for somebody else. So you have to be really sort of aware of that. Um, I, I think that if you're honing your chops, it's a great way to start. My suggestion would be to, uh, if you find a beat that you like, do something on top of that beat, then reproduce that beat. Uh, in a way that's even more perfect for you. Um, so maybe the key or 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 the production or the sounds, own that recording, and then um, you know, and then yeah, you can you can certainly assign a piece of that uh, percentage of that copyright back to the person who originally wrote that track, uh, even though you own that recording. If you pay for it, you own it. But I think you have to be very very uh, aware of the finer points of of buying beats off of YouTube or off of the internet because uh, you may own that that version of it but you know they can argue that they could change a hi-hat pattern again like i said and that becomes a whole new version of a song that they can then turn around and sell again i wouldn't suggest it if you wanted to use it as a palette to write on and then and then kind of recreate on top of that that's probably uh the way to go but there was a second half of that question which was not that um yeah he was talking about um you know making changes so when he brings his records to artists they usually want some changes yes. to or a whole new track. Yeah, I would I would say I would say be very open to that collaboration. I kind of talked about it. You know, we wrote the song for this film. Mariah sang it. She wanted to change it. Uh, we were of course very open to that. Um, I think that's a part of the collaboration is is you know, sometimes ego can get in the way and can kind of derail the creative process. It's kind of important to be very open to collaboration because it is possible. I've come to learn. It took me many years that other people might have good ideas too. <laughs> so uh, for me, um, I think that that it's usually in that case it only makes it better. Um, any other questions? Because maybe we'll do one more. I, I know that uh, uh, that that, uh, that we'll keep track of the questions. So if if there's something that we specifically don't hit, we'll respond uh, in an email. So maybe we'll do one more here because we're kind of we're kind of pushing. Okay. For, uh, this is from Sheldon. Dance teachers are using my music that I produce to teach online videos or teach online in videos. What rights do I have? Oh, you've got every right in the world. Uh, they're, if they haven't got a license from you, then they're infringing on your copyright. Or um, if, if they don't have a license from intermediaries that may, may, may uh, represent you, like your PRO, or uh, uh, maybe, you're, maybe you're signed up to TuneCore Publishing or something like that. They're infringing if they don't have a license. Okay, so it would be them. best to to reach out to them and and communicate with them directly. I mean, I wouldn't be accusatory. I'd be like, hey, just letting you know, uh, you're using my song here, and that's cool. Thank you so much, but um, we need to sort out the details of that. Um, yeah, yeah, don't be okay. We'll do one more, and then we'll bounce out of here. Um, give us one more, Zan. Do we have any more? Um, this one's from Reiner. 
actor has language and contracts with you uh, with YouTube producers saying the actors get paid 50% of the money used to monetize the channel. Can songwriters get the same? Well, I mean, YouTube does have licenses and pays royalties. The biggest problem with YouTube, I think, is that um, they play the um, the uh, safe harbor game r really, uh, you know, with bare knuckles. Um, and especially with the world that Reiner writes in, which is a lot of it's composing for screen productions, um, a lot of that stuff gets dumped into, I forget what they call it, general entertainment or something. They don't identify those productions. Uh, and that is the biggest problem. And then we and all of our cohorts around the world are working with YouTube to try and get that fixed. Well, it's nice to know that you guys are on it. Um, let's try and take a couple more. Yeah, um, this is from Danielle. What's your advice for great songwriters that don't have the funds to put together a team? Ooh, that's a that's a good question. Um, I mean, one one the the commodity that you have is your assets, your songs, and you can use that to leverage relationships. If somebody really believes in you and by the way, uh, you know, I, I listen to your, your song. It's really, 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 really good. Um, you know, you find, you find, you, you have to try and find people that believe in you. It doesn't mean that you have to go out and get Scooter Braun as your manager day one. Uh, you know, it means that, you know, you find somebody that, that can help you now, who believes in you, who can, who can uh, provide, um, you know, who can help you get up to the next level. And then hopefully you can keep working up the level. I mean, actually, I think Scooter and Bieber is a great example. You know, I mean, Scooter was an ambitious young manager and Justin Bieber was an ambitious young artist and they really came up and built something incredible together. So, you know, relationships can line up for six months or for six years or for, for however. Um, you know, I, I would say that, and you should definitely tune in next week because we're going to have a really great um, webinar about, about making your music sound better. Um, but I, I can appreciate that it's, it's an expensive um, undertaking to get into. What I would say is, Find, find producers, you know, by the way, on video, you can actually post projects, <laughs> again, really unintentionally, and, but you can actually create a project and you can see like, hey, I'm an artist looking for a producer. You can enter your project, reach out to the whole community and find potential uh, potential collaborators. I mean, we kind of went over that last week. So it's, it's, um, it's a really cool way to do that, but you don't have to spend, you don't necessarily have to spend money, um, but uh, again, and if you find a great producer who's not a particularly good songwriter, make a deal. Say, well, I'll let you own half of the master recording and we make these records. And so when I get paid, you get paid. Those are those are really great tools that you can um, that you can use to your advantage. And you'll find people you'll find people that believe in you for sure. Yeah. And, you know, and, and this this is the greatest era of networking ever. I mean, it's networking online, but it's networking. And 90 percent of the stories that I hear when I talk to to uh, up and coming people and people who are broken through to huge success right now, um, them, you know, DMing somebody online has been a huge part of them connecting with people. And Absolutely. so, uh, yeah, and, and, and you don't have to spend much money. I mean, Billie Eilish's records are made on about $4,000 worth of gear. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. Good point. It's, it really goes back to the song. Is the song amazing? Um, we're, we're, I, know we're, I know we're starting to get long, long winded here. So we'll do one more and then we'll bounce out unless we don't even have one more and then that's fine too. We do. Um, what, this is from Sheldon. Uh, what's your take on putting out consistent but random types of music slash songs that are released spontaneously versus with release of the brand and putting out less but more aligned content? Um, I think you have to be protective of your brand, um, especially if you're kind of releasing it on your own. Uh, I, I don't think that, you know, we're, uh, you know, we're, we're living in an era right now where people love hip hop and trap as much as they love, you know, pop music and whatever and, and, and EDM or whatever. So, you know, I, I don't, I think that people are very discerning listeners now and, and, and they just like good music. Um, but just be, just be kind of like consistent with your brand. I think somebody, you know, and I know that Mike talks about it a lot, but, um, you know, Drake is somebody that's very, very consistent with his brand. He makes sure that everything he puts out is really good and top notch. In fact, we we had um, we have something that we're going to share with you guys. Uh, Mike has put together a really, really comprehensive um, strategy here that I'm really meant to talk to. We just our time got caught up here, but we're going to share with you guys because I think there's a, a lot of incredible information here 
uh, that you guys can use. Um, and I'm just going to scan it here quickly, Mike. If it's okay with you, we'd love to share it with uh, with our with with the, the people who joined here today, um, because I think it's a tremendous amount of insights into how you're monetizing music. Uh, beyond artist names and song title, what's the most important piece of tracking information used by PROs? Use UPC ISRC codes. Is there a way to embed ISRC codes into a track independent of a professional mastering session slash engineer? Uh, well, uh, the first part of that question, um, ITI number, which is the international number that identifies the songwriter or the participants like songwriter uh, publishers. If you get everybody who's involved in the writing of the song and, the, and ideally all the publishers, you get their IPI numbers on there as well. Uh, that's incredibly important. Um, the ISRC code, um, some PROs take those. Uh, we are about to be, uh, be able to take them. Um, and I don't really know how to embed them. Uh, that might be uh, Jeff, Justin. You got a lot more audio production experience. Uh, how do you, I don't know how you embed an ISRC in, in, in your audio file, but well, I mean, uh, you, yeah, you you don't really need to worry about an ISRC until you are actually releasing something. Um, so I think that's the that's kind of like the first the first answer to that question. Um, and also, I think that there's what we're actually going to start doing in video is embedding ISWC codes, which is actually the kind of the writing ver the writer version of that. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it, th that will be uh, that will be something that will be coming down the pipe. I actually just saw a question here that I want to answer really quickly, uh, which is um, from Candy uh, Papagallo Tandy. I hope that I hope I got that right. Um, why did producers who sell beats only get such a big percentage of an indie artist songwriting songwriter song? When the indie artist is taking on the full risk of responsibility of taking a project to the finish line this is a great question and i'm going to answer it a couple quick ways one is historically speaking in hip-hop and r b uh the person that makes the beat gets half of the song period um i personally don't subscribe to that i per i subscribe to if three people are in the room we split the song three ways or four ways or however many ways uh it's just it's just it's just sort of the traditionally how it works in hip-hop and r b the beat maker gets half Who's, who's quote unquote the producer, um, especially if um, they're not getting paid for the beat. Uh, sometimes if they are getting paid for the beat, they they you can you can leverage that deal um, accordingly and 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 make on you know make it. But you know, and to answer your question, if the artist is taking on the full risk and responsibility. Yeah, but there's no beat. Otherwise, you wouldn't have anything to 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 be promoting. And you have to also remember, like, if you're if you're lucky enough to become the world's biggest artist based on a beat that you bought, um, and you're going and touring the world and making millions of dollars, they don't participate in that at all. So they're actually giving you a tool that you can use for your own benefit. So it's it's really give and take. Um, and there's there's a and and usually every deal is up for for discussion. Um, I want to continue doing this. Unfortunately, we can't do this all day. Uh, I wanted to thank Mike, obviously, who's, who's, who's stuck with us here. We really appreciate your time today, um, sharing all of the benefits and your knowledge of, of PROs and music publishing and, and the history of music and how we can take these tools and, and, and monetize them. Zach, who is not here, I uh, wanted to thank him. It really also tremendously smart people that I'm very blessed to know and we're very blessed to have as part of our sort of advisor community here within Midio. Um, and, uh, you know, as always, I'll give you my email address. It's J Gray, G R A Y at Midio, M D I I O.com. So thank you guys so much. Reach out at any point. Uh, I'm, I, I'll usually do my best to be responsive. Uh, some of you guys have been submitting songs for review. Uh, we are getting literally overwhelmed by them. So what we're going to do is we're going to do individually review them, uh, through, through Midio. So keep logging in, uh, to see. Uh, to, to get your response through through messages. Uh, thanks again so much, everybody. Thanks to Zan. Thanks to Mike. Thanks to uh, Thank Zach. Uh, thanks to Scott, who uh, who you may or may not know, but he helped facilitate all of this. And of course, to my partner Curtis Cerna, who uh, who is uh, fighting the fight with us every day, trying to bring you something for free. So uh, thanks again. Tell all your friends about it and hit us up with any questions. And we'll see you next week. So thank you so much, everybody. everybody. Take care. Thank you. Take it easy.